Today's webinar is entitled, What is Magic? Our presenter today is Andrew Phelps, Director of the RIT Center for Media, Arts, Games, Interaction, and Creativity, also known as MAGIC. Andy is Professor and Founder of the School of Interactive Games and Media. Andy is the originator of both the Bachelor's and Master's in Game Design and Development within the B. Thomas Golisano College of Computing and Information Sciences. Both the graduate and undergraduate programs are nationally ranked in the top 10 by the Princeton Review. Andy's work in games programming education has been featured in the New York Times, CNN.com, USA Today, National Public Radio, and several other articles and periodicals. He regularly publishes work exploring collaborative game engines and game engine technology and maintains a website featuring his work as an educator, artist, programmer, and game addict. His primary research and teaching interests include online gaming, electronic entertainment, 3D graphics and real-time rendering, virtual reality, and interactive worlds. Today, Andy will give you a peek into the magic of RIT. That is, he will give you insights into the presidential initiative, which encompasses new and exciting ways to collaborate among faculty, students, industry, and you. You'll learn more about digital media, technology, art, design, and interaction. Andy? OK. Uh, so hello, and welcome to uh, this presentation about magic. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my slides, and off we go. So, I can use my slides. There we go. Okay. So, um, the Magic Center, uh, as as Jen said, is a, a new initiative. Uh, it started out of a series of conversations that I had with uh, President Dessler over the last several years, really, um, and uh, we kind of got going in in February, and the core of the idea around the Magic Center um, is something that I think resonates with probably anybody that, that attended RIT for any length of time, which is, um, and it's also kind of the, the core of this, this idea by John Hawkins in the creative economy, which is ultimately right, new ideas, not money or machinery, are the source of success, and they're also the source of your satisfaction. Right? Um, so when we, when we build something, when we create something, um, the more things we can dream up, the richer the prospects of things we have to build from, the um, greater the wealth of our economy based on the number of ideas we have, uh, all that kind of stuff. So we were you know, having these discussions uh, around the campus, around the kinds of things that we were doing, and uh, so I'll just kind of launch right into why, first of all, why is there a magic center? Before even explaining what it is or what it does, like why did we decide to do this crazy thing in the first place? So we were talking about uh, RIT, and we were talking about the campus of RIT, and, and I described uh, the campus of RIT um, essentially as an iceberg, right? Which is if you're here and you're on campus and you're in one of the, in one of our you know production studio style courses, or you're you know hanging out in computer science house or the dorms or you know wherever, right? There's lots of stuff happening. There's lots of stuff constantly being tried. Uh, people are coming up with crazy ideas. Um, you know, they're we're just kind of reforming lots of uh, different stuff, right? But from the outside, right, if, if you're beyond the bricks and mortar of Henrietta, New York, um, it's really difficult to see that, right? It, it's below the surface, right? And so that's happening all the time at most universities. Um, but I think in particular, RIT tends to be a little insular and tends to focus internally instead of externally in, in some situations. At the same time, um, we see it, that makes it diff it, it's hard for good ideas to break the surface. Right? It, there's a, a tension at the water line where it's really difficult for uh, things that have a lot of you know, sort of unexplored potential to get the resources they need, to get the uh, visibility they need, to get the uh, support that they need uh, in order to really see if it's a, a good idea or not. Right, um, and we refer to this, you know, uh, nationally. Right, there's there's all kinds of famous examples of, you know, there was a, a product that 
you know, there was an iPhone before there was an iPhone, right? There was a computer before there was a computer. There was a this before there was that. Um, that just never really made it, never never got the traction, never got the visibility, never really explored the idea to its fullest potential, uh, that kind of stuff. So we were kind of thinking about what that meant, right? The other thing, simultaneously in our discussions, uh, is this notion uh, that, that a friend of mine, Ian Horswell, uh, used in a, in a lecture at Microsoft Research, uh, he's at Northwestern, which is this idea of protecting making as a mode of inquiry. Right? That RIT is a fantastically special place um, because when we have ideas, we tend to explore those ideas by actually making something, by making a thing and learning about uh, a field or a concept um, through the creation of, of an artifact. Right? So if we, if we want to understand how something works, we make one. If we want to understand if something's possible, we try it. Right? So there's this uh, sort of cavalier um, you know, nature within RIT that we're just going to go and do and learn from doing. Um, so, you know, these particularly apply to, to RIT, but they're, they're true of, of several modern universities, but modern universities are really good at, at educating people, or at least I think they're good at educating people because I work at one and I try to do a good job of it. Um, they're great at generating ideas. Right? Uh, you can, there's lots of smart people running around. You can go to crossroads and trip over thousands of good ideas, you know, just hanging out at the lunch table. Uh, they're great learning communities, right? Everybody here is focused and driven and engaged and doing all those, those things. They're a really unique balance to market forces. We can do things within universities that may or may not be commercially viable to shareholders in the short term, right? So we have kind of a different perspective of the the ways that we can engage. Um, and we have, for that reason, we have kind of a situational advantage for R&D, right? We can do R&D style topics in, um, in ways that, that commercial companies sometimes can't uh, or sometimes can't uh, justify in the short term, uh, that kind of thing. But modern universities are not good at finishing things beyond proof of concept, right? When the class is over, that's it. We're done. When we've written a paper about it, then time to move on. Right? There's really no way to get things beyond that sort of testing stage. Right? Once we see something that has a glimmer of, yeah, this looks like it's going to work. Yeah, we've we've kind of proven the ideas of our of our theory. Then then we're done. Right? So why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem one because. Uh, it's really difficult to make or test or understand things as they relate to the public. Right? It's not enough to have a proof of concept app on an iPhone that works for five people. Because right? uh, you don't know if it would really work right? out there in the wild with you know, a couple million people banging on it. Um, it's hard to demonstrate the value of the ideas that we're coming up with beyond their educational benefits. So in sort of discussion around higher ed right now, uh, there's lots of stuff about, you know, colleges are useful because students go in, they get an education, and then they go out and get a job. And so the value of the institution is around educating students for career preparedness. And that is certainly something that is important to RIT and important to higher ed generally. But it's not the only reason that higher ed exists. Right? We do, we serve other functions and we impact the public good in other ways, right? Um, you're probably aware of that most noticeably if you're sitting in a university medical center, right? You can tend to understand that there's value in the university when we're sitting in, you know, Strong Memorial Hospital going, I'm glad this hospital is here, right? So that makes sense. But what are the other ways and the other um, aspirations of ways that the university can impact the public? Uh, we're not having a great discussion around that, and part of the reason is that a lot of the things that we do and create and um, produce have value, but we don't talk about them and we don't get them in front of the public in a recognizable way. It also makes it really hard to assess public reaction, engagement, and critique, right? You can't know if you've built a good iPhone app by showing it to ten of your friends in the dorm room. You actually have to put it on the store, see if people are going to engage with it, and if so, how so on and so forth. So we can't really learn from what we can't touch. We can't engage with the public when we don't publish anything. 
Um, and then there's the idea of, of creativity, right? There's the idea of scale, right? And um, you know, I'm a I'm a card carrying designer. I usually wear black T-shirts, right? I'm perfectly happy to say this idea is no good and throw it out and start over. Uh, happens on a, on a regular basis, as uh, as Jen can probably attest. Um, but at the same time, that means that you have to have the next idea to move to, right? And that um, you have to uh, you know, carry some of them far enough along that you know whether or not they're good ideas. Right? You can't um, indiscriminately chop down fourths of ideas before you even know what you're cutting down. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I took this from my son, actually, uh, who's seven now, uh, and he's a Lego addict. And uh, anybody with young kids will tell you uh, they like to talk. And uh, every morning at breakfast, he will tell me the ideas that he had last night when he was going to sleep of uh, just stuff that he thinks would be interesting inventions, not unlike most children. Um, the interesting thing is that when he gets home, he will start building them one by one out of Legos right, to start to prototype which ones are good inventions. And he keeps a little book of which ones worked and why they worked and starts to explore those things. Right? And that's the kind of thing that inventors do, right? They actually try, they actually prototype, and then they see what sticks, okay? uh, And we have a lot of um, potential at a place like RIT to do a lot more of that than we're doing. Okay, so these were sort of the background ideas, the themes uh, that, that sprang up around why we're, why we're trying to do what we're doing. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're actually doing so you can see a little piece of it, um, understand the kinds of mechanisms that we're putting in place with this initiative, um, and go from there. So part two, what is MAGIC all about? So um, in, this, in a certain sense, it's uh, easier to define MAGIC by what it isn't than what it is, because uh, people are used to certain kinds of things at RIT. Um, so it's a university-wide research center of excellence. Okay, so what does that mean? That means it's not a college. It's not in any particular college. It's not an academic program. It's not a course. Um, it's something other than all of those things, right? Um, it's a physical and virtual laboratory environment. So we have some physical space that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, where we do a bunch of stuff. It's also a set of virtualized spaces and services that people are connecting to from all over the world to use and interact with and develop against and so on. Um, it's also a commercial entity, right? So there is actually a part of it uh, called Magic Spell Studios, LLC. Um, and we did that specifically for reasons uh, that I'll go into. Uh, for publishing apps and games and software and digital creations and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a brand uh, in the sense that we're sticking the little magic logo on things and that means that we have something to do with it and that we're studying it and that we're watching it uh, and so forth. Um, and it's also a, a, a building, right? Um, it's a set of resources in a, in a newly remodeled and uh, greatly overhauled space. So we'll kind of see all that stuff. Um, so I'll start with the space because it's kind of the easiest one to talk about. Um, if you were ever in the uh, Student Innovation Hall, uh, which some people know as the Innovation Center, um, and kind of that big round room uh, that, that's connected to student services uh, next to sort of Global Village. Um, so if you were in there, if you noticed that it was like, you know, if you were in there before this year, it was sort of big and wide open and um, you could run from one end to the other, and, um, and that was great in the sense that it was a wide open multi-purpose space. It was less great in the sense that if you did one thing in there, that was the one thing that was going on in there. You couldn't utilize any other piece of it for anything else. Uh, so we divided it up a little bit and we thought a lot about the usage of it. Right? Um, so that space now has our production and planning studio in it. It has a full-featured 30-seat uh, development laboratory in it. Uh, it has uh, coaching and mentoring facilities in it so that we can engage our students with people that have 
been down the road a little bit in terms of you know, creating and, and um, publishing things. And <coughs> the center of it is a, is a unique space. Um, the center of it's still open. Uh, it actually seats just about as many people as it did before. Um, so it's a large space. It can seat uh, up to like 150, 160 people. Um, but the, since they gave me a round room to design, it now has uh, the, the walls on the inside are coated with this uh, luminescent paint and we can project on them really, really, really well. Uh, and so we created a sort of holodeck system that has a bunch of HD projectors all aligned seamlessly so that you can sit inside it and get this big wraparound uh, computer desktop thing and uh, make all that stuff. You know, it's sort of uh, kind of like being on the bridge of the Star Trek Enterprise. So it's fun. Um, okay, so that's the space. Uh, I talked about the fact that it's kind of a freestanding unit. It's not really a, um, a degree or anything like that. And so the phrase that I'm using to describe this is sort of academic Switzerland, right? Um, it, that basically means that, you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult to get collaborations going across Know, various programs to get techies to work with artists, to get you know, engineers to work with creatives, all that kind of stuff, the left brain, right brain that Dr. Dessler likes to talk about. Um, so uh, we're, this is sort of like neutral ground, right? Um, anybody can come and be a part of what we're doing uh, and, and we welcome kind of everybody from all across campus. And it's a research org, so it falls within the Office of the Vice President for Research. So again, it falls kind of outside you know, any of the colleges or deans or any of that stuff. Um, and it's a very unique kind of research center. There's no place that's doing exactly what we're doing. Um, this is modeled off of, off of about a year's worth of looking around that I did and knowing some friends that have been doing this a lot longer than I have. Uh, but we sort of one up their their model. Uh, so, it, you know, like I said, it, it's partly a university lab. Uh, we do all the traditional things the university does, and it's partly this new commercial production studio. So the reasons for that are, um, you know, universities are great at what universities are great at, and we want to continue to do the things that universities are really good at, um, mostly because they've worked for universities for a real long time, and we should keep at it, right? So. You know, all the things that you likely experienced when you were here, right, um, you know, could be grants, it could be work study, it could be, um, you know, projects and independent studies and thesis and capstone and uh, collaborative coursework and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, all of the kinds of ways that we engage with projects um, around both students and faculty, um, all of the ways that we traditionally get, get funds to support those things, uh, all that kind of stuff is something that we're doing <clears throat> and continuing to do the way that the university does it, but kind of at a grander scale, right? We're sort of elevating this to the, the stature of a university-wide focus on these kinds of activities. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're doing a good job of supporting uh, the kinds of things that happen there. And so we're partnering with um, lots of different programs, lots of different faculty, lots of different colleges uh, to make that happen. But the other side is all the stuff that we were sort of, it was difficult to engage with before as because we were a university, because we were solely on a nonprofit footing, uh, it was really difficult for us to do certain kinds of things, right? Um, difficult for us to, you know, attract small business funding and help to advise our students through that process, right? Uh, it was difficult for us to go outside the university structure to recruit professional experts as needed. Um, it was difficult to uh, deal effectively with uh, third-party licensed content in certain aspects. There's a, there's a limit to how much a third party will trust their IP to a university because they have a way of kind of walking around inside a university sometimes. Um, and all of the ways that we deal with um, you know, IP negotiation and um, you know, titles and uh, profits and resources and all that kind of stuff is set up uh, really well in a university context, but it wasn't set up necessarily to make sense for something like media production, right? where you're going to take losses early on before you have 
something that's shippable. Um, things are not always funded 100% uh, before you've ever started down the road of creating something. So um, there's, it gives us a lot more flexibility. Um, it gives us the ability to uh, act as a publisher right, for our own students uh, as well as our faculty and staff. Right? So we were doing um, probably not the best job of helping people touch platforms like iOS or Google Play or Xbox Live or you know, some of these things. Um, and those are content channels that are becoming increasingly important because they connect to all the devices that everybody has. And so we want to make sure that uh, we're engaged in that and that we're advocating on behalf of our student body uh, as well as on behalf of the institution. And uh, Spell Studios gives us a way to actually engage in that scenario much more effectively. So <clears throat> when you think about the kinds of things we do, here's a list of kind of very traditional things that we do. Um, and, and you know, you probably, when you were an alumni uh, or when you were a student, dealt with some of these. And now that you're an alumni, you're seeing other students engage with these. But the big one there that I want to highlight is storytelling. Right? So people um, ask me a lot, you know, how did you do the games thing? How did you grow those programs? How did you, um, you know, how did you have all that success with with what I was doing with that? And um, that, that came up at a panel at Game Developers Conference last year, and I think Jen was even in the audience. And uh, basically the answer I gave was that it was mostly about storytelling and narrative. We created a narrative for what we wanted the experience of IGM to be, and then we told that narrative over and over and over again until it became the reality of what IGM was. And Whenever you launch a, a product or a brand or an experience, right, you have to think from you know, the, the end user's point of view. You have what we call it experiential design. Right? You think from the viewpoint of the person that, that is experiencing it or using it or engaging with it. Um, and you look at that story right? and you broadcast that story and what it should be. And a lot of the work that we do at RIT has such a great story behind it, has such a, a wonderful narrative to tell. Um, when people find out about it and they really engage with it, they welcome it and understand it and really make it cool, but we don't do necessarily a great job of telling that story. Right? And so a big part of what Magic is engaged with is not only the development and the design of things, but then helping to actually raise their profile um, and understand what they are through telling the story of the groups that are doing it. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of that is mentorship. Uh, a lot of that is putting students uh, and student teams in contact with people that have already done it um, or that are doing it now at a broader scale, uh, so on and so forth. Um, yeah? This would be a great time to take a couple of questions. Okay. Um, that relate to this directly. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions that we received was, well, how do we tell students about what we're doing in magic? How can they learn about the opportunities that exist? The opportunities for students, for students to participate with magic. How okay. are they learning about magic? Um, right. what, what can they do? What does that look like? Right. So, um, so there hasn't been a lot of outreach to students yet because uh, the last few months have been, you know, build the building, uh, put the walls in place, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, one of the things that we're, we're doing right now is we're making a big push around uh, social media, a uh, big push around uh, campus communications. Um, there's a bunch of stuff going live right now about uh, websites, about newsletters, about um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, the other, it, around events, right? So we're doing speaker series and hackathons and uh, lab events and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, the the once we go live in the spring, probably the best thing to do is start showing up. Right? Um, physical space has a wonderful way of sort of inviting people into it. Uh, and the more you you know, you're going to be engaged and find out more about kind of what's bubbling behind the scenes uh, just by being there. Um, the other thing we're going to be doing. Uh, over the course of the spring is reaching out to alumni networks, um, you know, notable alums, alums with particular experiences, or just you know folks that are engaged in the industry and want 
um, to give back in terms of mentorship opportunities, uh, to start hosting events and um, Q&A and uh, connections between what our students are doing now and um, you know, connecting them up with folks in the field. Right? So a number of different things are kind of just beginning to really trickle out uh, online. The nexus point for that is probably the website right now, um, but that will continue to expand. And that's a great segue. Without even realizing it, um, that was the next question that I was going to ask you. Since we're talking to alums today, we've received a lot of questions from alums saying, how can I get involved? Mm -hmm. What are the next steps? What can I do? So it's a great, a great segue. Um, certainly referring folks to the website as well as our social media channels is the best way to stay connected and engaged with us and, and learn what it is that we're doing. Okay. Um, so to continue on, uh, so this is sort of the wrapping up the list of things that you know we're engaged in and, and that we're putting structures and resources and uh, plans in place to kind of deal with. Um, <coughs> and I just want to point out that none of these are exhaustive, right? Like uh, we're going to come up with situations where we wind up engaging in ways that we haven't yet articulated because you can't know them until they happen. And we we know that we plan for that in air quotes as best we can, um, but we know that, that uh, for a couple of years this is pretty new and uniquely different uh, for a university to engage in, and, and so uh, we're going to be learning a lot as that rolls forward. Uh, but I think the important thing is that it all boils down to, it all starts with make. Right? If you don't make anything and you don't have any stories to tell and you don't have any you know, interesting opportunities and you don't have any creative you know, vision or potential, uh, it all starts with making stuff, right? And so at its core, um, magic is a place for making stuff. Well, it's difficult to make things alone, uh, and so we're doing that with a couple of other strategic partners, right? So we're doing that first and foremost with the Simone Center, and the Simone Center uh, shares with us the, um, the part of the the round room uh, around mentorship, right? Because there's a lot involved and engaged with entrepreneurship, with starting a business, with uh, understanding whether or not you want to start a business, with engaging with other businesses, uh, all that kind of stuff, right? And so we're working with them, they're working with us. Uh, it's a little bit of a blurry line and we're kind of tripping over each other's toes, uh, but that's a very happy form of chaos, right? Uh, because it's what, it's what actually we would envision as being the right working relationship um, because uh, you know it's they're doing a lot of things that are impacting us and benefiting us we're doing a lot of things that are impacting them and benefiting them uh, and we're doing a, a nice thing to kind of make that work out right um, we're also working with the innovative learning institute right because increasingly we're understanding that uh, people are learning online or even if they're not learning online, they're learning in ways that are augmented through online. Um, there's a lot happening in terms of the way higher ed in general is approaching, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the thing that we're involved with, right, digital media, games, interaction, apps, all that stuff, is at the core of a movement that's sort of transforming the way we teach and how we learn and all that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> so we're looking at that, and so we're engaging with them, and there's a couple of things that uh, are coming out of that. So one is uh, we are uh, just about ready uh, to look at uh, the establishment of a minor uh, through the School of Interactive Games and Media, but also with some uh, help from other areas and uh, possibly some you know, extended online interaction and some new modalities of the way we're doing it, um, we're going to be looking at a, at a minor specific to free and open source software. Right? And that's actually new for RIT and new for the world. Right? It's rare that things are formally focused around sort of a FOSS mentality to um, digital creations. So that's the first thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Second thing is we're looking at um, a, a set of uh, sort of 
a next endeavor in the creation of coursework in games and learning. Right? And so what we mean by that is not so much game creation in the way that um, like IGM is exploring game creation and development and the way that lots of my alumni are, are engaged with industry creating these things, but more about how do, how do games and interacting with games and simulations uh, re recontextualize the way that we think and learn. Right? And so um, if I was going to learn economics, right, one of the best ways I could engage with economics is um, you know, things like SimCity. Right, where I can sit there and play with the rates and play with the model and you know, tweak a couple variables and watch what happens and then go back and play it again and then go back and play it again. Right? Um, so that's another kind of way that we're engaging. with. So this partnership between these entities is um, you know, just starting to really gel and uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch over the next little bit. Um, okay. So last but not least, uh, when you say that you're going to um, kind of, you know, we, we spent a bunch of money in reorg building, uh, we created an org, we're launching lots of initiatives, we're making lots of things happen, um, we're doing all that kind of stuff, and uh, then, so why, what do we hope to learn? What do we hope to accomplish, right? Like, you know, other than doing it to do it, what are we really after, right? So the core of it is that, um, we're making use of both academic and commercial models, but we're, we're selfish, right? We're doing so for our own ends and our own reasons. Um, we're really after the learning. We're really after, right, um, how are people consuming digital media and what does that teach us about ourselves? Right? <clears throat> so the real goal is to establish a community of learners that are engaged and active in building things, right? And they're going to drive each other to experiment and push each other to build things that are weirder and stranger and more kind of out there than ever before, right? Um, so that's my goal. My goal is to uh, hopefully get a whole bunch of people that push each other uh, to just, you know, try things that have never been tried. Um, how to do that, how to assess it, how to sustain it are all kind of very much on my mind. Uh, we'll see how that goes. And so I think it's really important that that impacts students, right? That, um, that students are going to be the, the beneficiaries of all of this, right? They're going to get a very different educational experience than they get in the classroom. They're going to get a very different educational experience than they get in their own program. Right? Um, and I say that as somebody that has bounced around between art programs, computing programs, design programs, uh, et cetera, and um, I probably didn't bounce around enough. And so the goal is to create a place where students are really kind of mixing it up with a whole bunch of students uh, working on projects that are you know, pushing the limits of what can be done uh, in ways that lets them kind of mix across all the boundaries and all the stereotypes and all the um, ways that we sort of normally think of a student's interaction with RIT. Um, so it's a vehicle for learning. Uh, to practice extended well beyond the classroom. And so some particular notes to alumni. Um, first and foremost, uh, you know, obviously um, doing this is not free. Uh, it's not even cheap. And it's not funded the way a normal academic program is funded, right? It's not tuition paid. No one is showing up saying, you know, I'm going to take a course in magic and magic and get some, you know, some percentage of their tuition for that course and all that kind of stuff. It, it's, a, it's a very different model, right? And we're trying to do things that stretch the boundaries. And so that means we have to find different ways to support the kinds of things that we're doing, right? And part of that starts with alumni, right? Um, so if you go on the MAGIC site, uh, there's a little uh, spot that you can uh, choose to direct your gift to MAGIC. Um, and that's what I did for exactly these reasons, because I am Super excited about it. Um, the other thing is get involved, right? Uh, so the coaches and the mentors and you know all that kind of stuff, right? Um, you guys are out there in industry. You guys are out there making stuff happen. Um, our students can learn from you. Our students can benefit from your knowledge directly, 
right? Because they're now you know, trying to do their own thing. And uh, folks that have been there before that have dealt with the larger, thornier, more complicated issue, um, it's really great when they can kind of know what's going on there. Um, and last but not least, you know, just being engaged and involved and um, knowing what's going on. And like, you know, like we discussed earlier, the easiest way to do that is to find out what's happening on the website and follow us on all the social media stuff. Um, and if there's a channel that you're using that um, we don't know about or aren't publishing on, then we want to know what that channel is because chances are it should be there, um, so on. So uh, that's kind of that's the core of the presentation, but um, I'm here to answer questions and so on. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for your introduction to Magic at RIT. We do have a number of really great questions from our participants, and mm -hmm. I'd like to share a couple of those with you. Mm -hmm. I know that we will not have time to address all of them, but I do want to let our participants know that there will be other opportunities and other ways that we were able to answer your questions if they were not done during the time that we have today. Um, the first is, you know, Andy, as you talked about um, what we're doing and ways for students to get involved, knowing that we have a lot of alumni on the line here, can you talk about who the other folks are that are involved? You talked about the Simone Center, and you talked a little bit about ILI, but can you also talk about who the other faculty are and, and some of our affiliates sure. as well in that model? Sure. Um, so the model is kind of unique because any faculty member across the university can choose to affiliate their work and their research with the Magic Center. Um, now, obviously that's going to be you know, kind of most attractive and appealing to folks that are engaged in, in digital media, digital humanities, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but <clears throat> kind of the core, so, you know, we have a, a, about 30 faculty already um, that have chosen to affiliate. And um, so those are, are faculty from interactive games and media, um, a couple from computer science, uh, information technology, there's uh, the, the core new media faculty over in CIS, so Adam and Jason, and all those folks that I've worked with for a long time and have had such great partnerships with. A um, couple of folks over in, in liberal arts, um, in, in English, in uh, communications, uh, museum studies, uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a pretty eclectic mix already, uh, and it's only going to get weirder, I think, as time goes on. Um, you know, but that's, you know, we're, we're exploring some collaborations right now with uh, lots of different departments kind of all over the university. Um, pretty much any department or group that has a project course is something that we can be engaged with, or if it's outside of the course, um, co-op programs make a great way to engage, right, because we can engage in co-op. You know, there's lots of different possibilities, so there's no like one set model. Um, but those are the, the kinds of things that we're engaged with to date. Right? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see us do something with the UDC project uh, as one example of the kinds of things that we're probably going to go deep on. Great, thank you. We have another couple of questions um, related to intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about you know how, how we protect that and, and who owns that for mm -hmm. our students and you know our faculty who are are creating and making things? Right. What does that look like? Right. So um, the the core of our intellectual property um, in layman's terms, in, in the way that RIT deals with it, is essentially if a student makes something, the student owns something. Right? If you made it as a student, you own it. Caveat to that is if we're paying you as an employee to make it, then we own it because you're technically an employee at that point. Uh, when faculty members make things, it's a little more complicated. Um, you know, generally, they own them sort of uh, unless they're you know, through things that were funded by RIT or through a grant to RIT or all of that kind of stuff. So that can get a little bit thornier. Um, what, when everybody asks that question, what they're usually asking about is they're asking about something like Magic Spell, and when we go and publish a game or something like that, like who owns that stuff, right? So the, the core principle of, of what we're trying to do is unchanged, right? So when students, if a bunch of students made a game together and used Magic Spell to put it on the App Store, right, they still own the intellectual IP, um, 
we're going to try to do a better job of when a group of students do something, how to actually deal with the group rather than all of that. So there's some nuances there. Um, but they own it. Now, what we are going to do is for the lifespan that we're supporting the project is uh, we're going to take a minority uh, web share off of that because we're providing services. Right? We're providing legal, we're providing uh, publishing, and marketing, and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Right? Um, but it's intended as a launch pad. Right? So nobody should be looking at this going, oh, well, I don't want to do that because I'm going to have a, a string up attached to me later, you know, sort of thing. Right? When things hit a certain size, uh, when they scale, when it's time for them to scale out, right? that's, that's for them. Right? Um, we want to produce happy alumni, um, not try to you know, lock everything up. Couple questions related to perhaps the future uh, alum. A um, couple questions related to how can we perhaps engage um, young game designers um, specifically. Um, certainly other, other majors, other fields as well. Um, but do you see opportunities within Magic? Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the K-12 efforts that we're mm -hmm. involved with? Sure. So. Um, now, obviously, uh, digital media right now, and, and right now it's games, but you know, so it's becoming sort of games and apps and, and other stuff. Um, the one of the things that we're doing is, is, you know, to your point, we're doing a lot of outreach and a lot of engagement with uh, sort of regional K-12s uh, right now. Uh, so they're coming to us saying, you know, we've got a bunch of folks interested in this. How can we, you know, kind of engage with this and, and all that kind of stuff? We uh, historically, done some things with the Kids on Campus program over the summers. Um, we're uh, we're hosting a meeting actually uh, in a couple of weeks for some regional K-12s to come and engage with us about uh, are there projects we can do? Are there after school programs we can engage with? Are there uh, ways to connect to their STEM uh, classes or uh, that kind of stuff? I was just at uh, one of the schools that. Um, in the region, uh, giving a talk to their science class about you know, here's how games are made and here's how uh, basic Newtonian physics are included in games and uh, that kind of stuff. So uh, that was kind of fun for a fourth grade class. Um, and then in the in the spring, in April, we're hosting uh, an unconference uh, that all of the regional K-12s are invited to, so they can come and spend a day and explore with us the way that we're teaching digital media, the kinds of things that we're doing, which of those things translate to the K-12 classroom, um, some other best practice examples from K-12 classrooms on uh, ways to engage uh, around these topics. Um, so it's kind of an ongoing conversation. Uh, there are larger initiatives within RIT right now, right? So there's a presidential message about the new charter school that we're looking at. Um, there is, you know, the Office of K-12 is sort of revamped and shifted its focus over the last year, um, and the impact that something like ILI is having with K-12 is something that we're exploring as well. So we're kind of all in the mix and looking at that kind of stuff, right? Um, the other thing we're doing is, is uh, we make sure that all of our K-12 partners um, are informed about the speaker series that we do. Uh, so we do a, a speaker series as well as I bring some special guests in uh, through my office. And all of those talks are open to the public. Uh, they're open to alumni. They're open to um, you know, pretty much anybody that wants to come. Uh, and some of those have direct um, impacts for certain areas, right? So like in, uh, in April, or excuse me, in February, we're bringing in Warren Spector, right, uh, on the 10th. And we're bringing in Anil Dash on the 12th, right? And for anybody interested in digital media development, way that games are transforming the kind of you know, experiences that we have. Those are both great speakers uh, for that kind of stuff, right? So there's lots of different ways that we're looking to engage with that stuff. And certainly another way that we can engage with alumni is at Imagine RIT. And we will have a presence at Imagine RIT. We're still working on that. Um, so anything that you'd like to share about what people might be able to expect at Imagine RIT? I can tell you that we will be at Imagine RIT. You don't redo the 
the imagine uh, the innovation center without uh, uh, without having a trick or two up your sleeve for uh, the big day when everybody's here. Uh, I can also tell you that it's secret. I can also tell you that it's special. Uh, and uh, no wizard gives away uh, every single one of their spells before folks have seen it. So I'm playing that one close to the best. Fair enough. Or, or to your wizard guard. Right. If you're, if you're right. Oh, away. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. We do have time, I think, maybe for one more question. I'm just going through the queues here to see if I have any more that we did not get to. I think that may be it. Okay. If you do have additional questions, if you do um, think of questions after you hang up the phone, um, you can certainly email questions to us at ritalum.rit.edu or tweet us at um, rit underscore alumni. Please use the hashtag MeritWebinars and we'll direct your question to Andy.